this is good. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I guess uh, you're tired from this session. Um, I hope I uh, keep my talk short and uh, uh, leave you. <laughs> so this is the work that we recently uh, did in our lab uh, uh, with uh, Professor Indra Juddalan. Uh, he's my advisor uh, at the Department of Computer Science at UT Austin. And, uh, the problem is basically predicting gene disease connections. Um, this is a very significant problem, as you all know. Uh, for example, uh, predicting novel associations could lead to gene therapy, and you can even personalize medicine. Uh, if you, for example, know that a particular gene or set of genes are responsible for the disease. And biologists usually prefer, they don't, for example, uh, ask for a, um, which gene, uh, for example, causes the disease. Usually what they ask for is a sort of a list of a handful set of genes that you could hopefully prioritize and, uh, and which could, they could uh, further in, uh, investigate, for example, through wet lab studies by testing it on uh, other sort of lower level organisms and so on. And uh, this is uh, the typical data that you get. You have uh, some genes and uh, you, you know some sort of associations between genes and diseases. And, and the goal, for example, is to see if uh, the, the gene AQP1 is, is responsible for diabetes in some sense. And so far, uh, people have sort of conceived of all network-based approaches. For example, uh, the connections between different genes uh, uh, are known to play a very important role in, uh, in predicting uh, the connections between genes and diseases. For example, if you know that APQ1 interacts very often with uh, two other genes, APQ6 and APQ5, and if one of those uh, uh, those two genes are responsible for uh, uh, is responsible for uh, diabetes, then you might suspect that maybe APQ1 is also responsible because these three genes are part of some sort of a functional unit. And people have also used uh, other organisms. For example, in this case, we have mouse and plant, uh, etc., etc. Et you can collect phenotype information from other organisms, how genes influence phenotypes in other organisms. And by sort of uh, analyzing the phenotype, gene phenotype relationship in other organisms, you might be able to sort of uh, deduce uh, gene disease relationships in humans. Uh, in fact, we recently uh, developed a method, Gadapul, that basically sort of uses, uh, uh, incorporates information from other species phenotypes. But so far we have seen that all these methods sort of uh, that use network-based information um, sort of uh, uh, lack in one respect. The, the, what I'm trying, trying to say is that so all the, the methods are transductive in the sense that if you want to get predictions for a new disease, uh, these methods are practically ineffective because uh, the methods rely on sort of connectivity of the network uh, to make predictions. For example, if I, if, if I want to know something about a node in the network, then network-based approaches can help because uh, they sort of either compute some sort of similarity or do some sort of page rank or some, some sort of walk based method, then they naturally rely on the notion of connectivity in the network. So, uh, but what we are seeking for is a method that's uh, basically inductive in the sense that if, if I have a new disease, can I come up with, can I come up with recommendations? Can I come up with, gene, uh, can I come up with a meaningful list of uh, uh, potential genes that could be affiliated with the, with the phenotype, with the gene, uh, with the disease in this case? Um, so ideally, mathematically speaking, I need a function that, in some sense, takes an encoding of a gene and then, uh, or an encoding of a disease and then returns, uh, let's say, a list of uh, potential genes <coughs> for, the, for the disease. Or you can think of a scoring function that could uh, score every gene with respect to this disease. And you can use these scores in order to, sort, let's say, sort these scores and, and then you can return, let's say, the top five or top ten, how many of the biologists can can look at. So it is natural to think of this uh, problem um, coming from a computer science background. It's natural to sort of look at this problem and say, oh, it's, it's basically a, a sort of an, a, the, the problem that's, uh, that's very common, for example, the Netflix problem where people uh, predict uh, ratings, what, ra what rating a user would give a movie. So it's naturally a matrix completion problem if you think of genes as rows and diseases as columns. But the, <laughs> but the problem with applying uh, the, the vanilla matrix completion is that is the data set is very, very sparse. If you, if you look at the rows of the matrix or the columns of the matrix, the gene disease matrix, uh, 
the shaded region is very, very small in the sense that you have many, many genes for which we have established known associations, and similarly we have many, many diseases for which we have established no, no associations so far. So s applying basic matrix completion can only perhaps tell you about the, the shaded area. It cannot say anything about the sort of the, the unshaded area in the matrix. But the new biology, the biologists are really looking for novel associations. And the novel associations can only spring from the white area of the matrix. And, uh, and basically, the, the existing methods cannot uh, because they sort of rely on some uh, seed nodes, some sort of associations that already exist for a disease to come up with predictions. So this sort of motivated us to develop this, uh, the so-called inductive matrix completion method. And before jumping into the method, I would like to sort of give you some intuition as to what is happening with the, with the, me with the method itself. So if you think of the basic linear regression, what you want to predict is a target variable and you have some sort of features and you want to represent, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> this particular target variable as a sort of linear uh, combinations of the features in your data. Right? That's essentially linear regression. But then uh, here, uh, the target essentially is a disease for us and uh, the, the variables that you're trying to uh, use are essentially the genes or the features for the genes. And uh, in multitask learning, it is common to simultaneously predict uh, the combinations of uh, features for different tasks. Let's say you have like two diseases and uh, you want to simultaneously predict uh, uh, the, the both the diseases. So one straightforward way you could do is just uh, independently uh, treat each disease and just run a linear regression of, uh, over the gene features. But then that's not going to be really helpful because you know that uh, some diseases are inherently correlated and some, some others are not. So you, you may want to sort of uh, use the fact that two diseases are somehow similar to come up with coefficients that, again, are, are similar so that the predictions themselves become similar for the diseases. This is what, uh, what machine learning pe people call uh, multitask learning as against single task learning where you would just treat them independently. So in multitask learning, uh, one could even think of associating features with the tasks themselves. For example, uh, what if you have features for diseases? Let's say someone tells you that, well, these features, uh, uh, I could, for example, uh, do a bag of words uh, of uh, articles written upon diseases and then say that this, in some sense, represents the disease. So if I know that uh, two disease articles are looking similar, then the diseases might themselves be similar, right? So, because the articles, let's say, talk about the clinical uh, uh, care or the symptoms of the disease and so on. So, if the two, the words describing the diseases are similar, then perhaps the diseases themselves are similar. So I could extract these sort of word-based features for diseases and then uh, come up with features on the columns of this matrix. So, so now, what, now the problem interestingly becomes the so-called uh, sort of bilinear prediction as against a linear regression where you would use one set of features and you would learn one set of coefficients. Now you have two sets of features and you would learn two sets of coefficients. Uh, where essentially you're, uh, you're doing a regression on the row features and a regression on the column features simultaneously. And there's a parameter matrix that sort of captures this uh, uh, process going on. So far we have uh, talked about it as a regression problem, but the real challenge here is that the, the matrix that we are trying to predict, the, the basically the columns of this matrix, are essentially uh, very, very sparse, and, and uh, we only have few... Uh, X's which basically denote the known entries. And we have many, many unknown entries in this matrix because we only have uh, a few thousands of known gene disassociations and the possible number of gene disassociations could be as, as big as uh, uh, like close to a million or so. So, so how do we sort of uh, uh, deal with the sparsity of information that we have, right? So that's where this sort of inductive matrix completion uh, figures in. So you have many missing values and we have to come up with a model that sort of interpolates this missing values. And the way, you have to inter the way you have to complete this matrix is that you have to use the known associations as well as use these external features that you know about the genes and diseases. And uh, this is where this method sort of stands out uh, of other, that this, is, this is what sort of makes this method novel in the sense that uh, it tries to use uh, as much external information you can get on a gene or a disease and, uh, uh, and in some sense, you, you can use it seamlessly in the sort of matrix completion framework, uh, whereas a vanilla matrix completion framework uh, would allow you to just use 
the associations information that you already have. So uh, technically, uh, what's exactly going on? So you, <clears throat> so so the, the the entry AIJ is basically is what is unknown, and you and you think of that entry is being generated by applying this row feature corresponding to the uh, to the gene and the column feature corresponding to the disease on this parameter matrix Z. Uh, so notice that. Um, the information that is given to you is X's and Y's and the, and the partial observations of the matrix. And the problem boils down to learning this parameter matrix Z. And if you look at the dimension of the parameter matrix Z, it is simply the number of features, number of row features times the number of column features. So if you were looking to do a matrix completion, essentially you would depend on the rows, number of rows of the matrix and number of columns of the, of the matrix. But now the problem sort of boils down to learning a parameter matrix that is sort of independent of the number of rows and columns, but it just depends on how many f row features and how many column features you have in the matrix. If you think of Z as a rank one matrix, for example, then you can just write it as an outer product of these two vectors, and uh, essentially your prediction is essentially a regression on the row features, the gene features, and a regression on the column features, and it's just, and just, just a product of these two. Uh, sort of reg regressed values is essentially a prediction. And in the more general case, when Z is a low rank matrix, let's say of rank K, then essentially you will do a regression simultaneously on rows and columns and take these low dimensional representations and take it in a product. And that would give you the sort of uh, the prediction or the, that's, that's your sort of uh, interpolated value uh, for the entry IIJ. And this is the interactive matrix completion. And you could uh, write it down as a simple optimization problem uh, albeit non-convex, uh, if you write Z as a WH transpose, then essentially you're looking for this uh, factor matrices W and H, such that they're sort of close uh, uh, to the observed values P, I, J, uh, wherever the gene disposition is known, and uh, simultaneously you want the, the matrix WH transpose to have a low rank, which is the standard uh, sort of uh, structural constraint you put uh, for matrix completion problems, and uh, then there's and then you can sort of throw in uh, uh, alternating minimization-based solvers at this problem, and you can do it in a very scalable fashion. Uh, recently, we have developed uh, scalable methods for this problem in our lab. And uh, again, uh, it's important to recognize the difference between matrix completion and inductive matrix completion is that uh, here, uh, the number of parameters you seek are essentially uh, depending only on the number of row features and column features versus a standard matrix completion where you would uh, require dependence on the number of rows and number of columns of the matrix. So <clears throat> uh, how do we construct features for rows and columns? So far we have uh, seen only about the method, so how do you exactly construct? So you can think of throwing in many uh, data sources. For example, you might today come in with a, see, th this is uh, something that I think would be helpful for gene disease prediction. Then as long as you have a, have a way to sort of represent uh, the information that you have, uh, let's say, in, in a real-valued vector format so that could sort of meaningfully describe what you have, then you basically have a set of features that you can throw in uh, as, a, as a component in this problem. For example, one of the features that we use in the prediction is the genomic, uh, the microarray expression data. So for example, you can think of uh, different uh, microarray expression collected on a gene, and you can do it on a bunch of genes, and uh, for example, you can do a PCA on, this inf on the on the micro information that you have, and let's say take the top 100 components which you think are more meaningful, and then that gives you 100 features that you can use. And similarly, you can, let's say, uh, for, the, for the diseases, for example, you can look at the text data and then uh, use what uh, the, the natural language processing people do, which basically is so the so-called uh, document representation, the TF-ID representation, where you represent each document as a vector, uh, uh, where the coordinates of the the coordinate spaces are essentially words. And uh, so these are, uh, these techniques themselves are not new, but, but the interesting thing is that you can sort of uh, use the different uh, information that we have and appropriately transform the data into sort of real valued features and, uh, and you can uh, throw it in this inductive matrix completion framework. For example, this is uh, uh, the comorbidity data which basically gives similarity between diseases. And once you have a graph of uh, graph of uh, sort of similarity between diseases, what I can do is I can look at uh, 
So you can basically represent this graph by a matrix, an adjacency matrix, and I can look at, for example, the top uh, 10 or top, top K uh, eigenvectors of this graph that basically contain significant information of, about the diseases, and I can use that as, a, as an encoding of diseases themselves, because if two diseases uh, are, are similar in the space, are, are actually really connected by a, by a heavy edge in this graph, then their vector representations will be similar because they are derived from the top eigenvectors. So, <clears throat> so one can throw in different information and obtain features for genes, and similarly throw in uh, different information and obtain features for diseases, and you can basically uh, assemble them all together and then throw in at this method, which is inductive matrix completion. Now, as long as you, if you have richer and richer features, uh, what we usually find in experiments is that throwing more and more useful features can only help. Uh, it can only improve the <coughs> predictions. Uh, so here are a set of res results on uh, the online mental inheritance uh, database, and I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with the data set, the OMM data set. So, uh, the, so here the way to read this graph is that on the, ex on the horizontal axis we have the, the number of genes you look at, and you notice that we only have uh, top 20, top 40, which is, which is sort of more reasonable to look at because biologists can often look only at a few genes and uh, to see if the method is really uh, doing anything good and so that they can sort of take that forward uh, and do their own wet lab experiments. And on the, on the vertical axis, we have the likelihood that you actually recovered something, something meaningful. So, uh, so clearly a method uh, that does extremely well has to be on the top left in this graph. And, uh, and our method, uh, which is the black one, uh, does reasonably well in the sense that you get, uh, you recover, uh, uh, for example, by looking at the top 50, you recover about, uh, uh, you, about a point, uh, 20 percent of the predictions are right in, in, that, in some sense. And this, uh, the other methods, for example, uh, are state-of-the-art methods for the same problem. Uh, you, the interesting thing to look at is the, the, the worst performing method in this graph. Uh, which is the bottom curve, uh, that is the, the vanilla matrix completion that doesn't use features, which is expected because, uh, as I was telling you, most of the diseases uh, that we know today in the OMM dataset, for example, have just have badly any associations. They have like at most one association. So if you have a method that relies only on association type data, then you are going to get very bad performance on diseases. And uh, so it's, it's, it's always sort of, in, it's very informative to use uh, uh, external information that you have on genes and diseases. Clearly, uh, you can see the performance gap between not using any features and using features. And in fact, there is a middle line, the yellow curve that you see, which is a method that, uh, uh, not the yellow one, the, the LEML that says, the LEML method essentially uses uh, only features on the rows but not on the columns. That is, it only uses gene features, but it doesn't use disease features. So clearly, using both the features can yield uh, a real good improvement over just using uh, one set of features or no features at all. <coughs> and another sort of interesting aspect to evaluate uh, given the method is that you can look at, you can ask, if I, set the f if I f fix the set of genes to be the ones for which I never knew any association before, how well does your method do? That is, if I, I so basically this is uh, sort of looking for novelty of the method, like can your method recommend novel genes? For example, uh, one of the problems that we have seen, and in fact there have been many papers written in the last couple of years on network-based methods is that these methods tend to um, uh, recommend uh, genes that are highly sort of popular in the network. For example, that could be a gene that is highly, highly connected in the network, and you wouldn't be surprised that if the gene comes up in the top five predictions of almost any, any disease that you look at, because simply because that's a very popular gene in the network, and it is very, uh, uh, even by random chance, this gene is likely to be connected to any disease. So, so, it, so that's one of the problems that plagues these network-based approaches. Um, uh, clearly, uh, those methods will, will fail on, uh, on this test because this test requires genes to be not connected to any other uh, gene in the network. So uh, network-based approaches clearly cannot uh, be performing as good as uh, other, uh, for example, inductive matrix completion that relies on other, other sources of information. And, uh, and you can also look at, uh, similarly, you can look at evaluation of uh, 
diseases where uh, you don't know any, any information uh, beforehand. Uh, and clearly, methods that uh, rely on only on association information cannot do well because, because these diseases do not have any associations before. So that explains this sort of uh, a very stupendous, really big gap between the, the between our method and, and the other state of the art methods, precisely because uh, our methods sort of rely on uh, uh, using as much external information as possible. And, uh, in, and, and it does so in a very uh, seamless uh, fashion. And finally, we looked at uh, evaluating uh, the methods on sort of novel associations in the sense that um, eventually this method is, is to be used by a biologist. And, uh, and the, the way the biologist uh, we fashion to use is that he would throw in all the information that, uh, that he has, and then he would expect for, an, for a disease of interest, uh, he would expect uh, something, uh, some, some novel biology that, that is discovered. And uh, to simulate that, what we did was we, we threw in all the OMIM associations and all the data that we had until a particular time, time stamp, and then we looked at, we scanned all the recent repositories uh, for novel associations established from that time stamp onward, and then and then looked and looked at uh, um, the sort of the, the prediction power of the methods for these sort of novel associations that were discovered after the timestamp. And uh, so a, a method that is really novel uh, would sort of succeed in this evaluation metric because this sort of mimic, uh, this sort of uh, imitates what a biologist uh, would actually look for in such a method. And clearly, uh, our method is competitive in this evaluation metric as well. And the and the uh, the performance, the ordering of the methods is sort of consistent with what we have observed in the previous plots. Um, that's all I have to offer. And there are many directions uh, for future work. Uh, for example, we have incorporated these um, features for nodes. For example, one can think of features on pairs instead of features on nodes. Um, to to give an uh, to give an idea, for example, you can think of uh, predicting friends a uh, link uh, links between friends and let's say Facebook. And sometimes you don't have features on users, but sometimes you may have features on the links themselves. For example, you may know when this link was formed, where this link was formed. For example, these two people, I don't, know anything about, I don't know anything about these people themselves, but for example, I know that these people met at this conference. These people met on this day, at this venue. So these are features on the, on the edge them itself, but not on the nodes. So similarly, you can think of features on gene phenotype pairs but not necessarily on genes and phenotypes. So then that requires sort of novel machine learning frameworks for, um, for sort of incorporating this additional information. And, uh, and, and there's an interesting sort of uh, interplay between biology and machine learning here. And that, in fact, has actually led to my th PhD thesis. Uh, like biologists helped me find interesting problems in machine learning and have been able to uh, apply the methods that I developed because of this uh, back in the, pro in the biological problem here. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. That was a great talk. Thanks. Um, uh, how ill-conditioned are these problems? So how many features do you have? How many uh, um, examples at the yeah. end? So, or pairs mm -hmm. of examples, right? Right. So, uh, so, so we have about, uh, uh, in this data set, we have about, uh, so it's a, this is the matrix. Sort of, you can think of it as a matrix, right? So you have about 20,000 genes and about 4,000 diseases. But this matrix itself is very sparse. Because for it to be dense, it has to have order 10 to the 6 uh, uh, non-zeros, but it has only about order 10 to the 3 non-zeros. So it's, it's a really sparse matrix. Um, but, but, so that's why the, 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 the vanilla matrix completion performs so bad. But, the number of, but what we do is we, by sort of collecting these, assembling these different feature sets, we, um, to get this, perf this, this level of performance, we actually use uh, about 500 features on genes and diseases. But what we interestingly find is that we can actually throw in more, more features. We can actually throw in more, more features. But there is a problem with throwing in more features. It, what happens is that throwing in more features gives you better, better and better performance during cross-validation. Because 
you can always sort of tune to the particular data set that you're working on. For example, if I'm working with this OMIM data set, I can always get a better accuracy by throwing in more features on this OMIM data set. But if I, if I can, but the question is, can I sort of translate that on a different data set? Then it, then it, then it need not work always. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be sort of uh, uh, careful in, in that sense. Uh, you, you, you should uh, tend not to overfit to the data set you're looking for. I, I guess the question would be then, how do you select pairs of features, right, that, that don't overfit? You want to select pairs of features, right, because you have uh, disease features and gene features, basically. Right. So, again, so uh, yeah. you have to go back to the optimization problem. Yeah. And then uh, make sure that you're cross-validating the parameters there well and making sure that you have uh, proper regularization. In this case, the, there's this trace norm regularization on the, on the parameter matrix. So you should be uh, sort of careful in how you implement the optimization there. 